Yes, Hello, I'm everyone. To Welcome to Starmer's uh, press conference, Starmer's 7 announcement at the Royal Society in London. And we'll be shortly connected with Bratislava, with our colleagues, for a synchronized uh, TV bridge and teleconference with Bratislava. Um, this is the seventh Starmus we are going to announce, and we never thought there would be seven, actually, when we started like more than 10 years ago. And, uh, but this festival is going to be very special, very special. And me uh, and Brian May will speak about that, why this festival is special. And uh, uh, there will be uh, some brainstorming about the topic of the festival why we choose this title and why it is important and why today, why today. Uh, so uh, before we start with the, uh, with the press conference and, and our brainstorming, I invite you to watch a short video of what the Starmus is about. Next festival is going to take place in Slovakia, Bratislava, from May 12 to 17, and it's called Starmusert, the future of our home planet. Uh, let's make sure that we hear our guests in Slovakia. Hello, Slovakia. Hello, Lama. Hey, Gerd. Hello. <laughs> uh, we hear you, but we can't see you. <laughs> Where are you? Oh, my. <laughs> it's a Danube. Right. <laughs> I can see, yes. Mm -hmm. You see us? Yes. Hey there. Hey there. <laughs> Hi. Hi. <laughs> so we have Tony Fadel, Ibanio Charpentier, and Richard Marco. But I will start introducing our guests now. Okay, so okay, today so for, for, for the press conference and for brainstorming, we have our guests. First of all, I want to introduce Dr. Jane Goodell, who is going to join Starmus Advisory Board. We are extremely honored, happy, we have no words. Uh, Dr. Uh, Jane Goodell, DBE ethologist, founder of the Jane Goodell Institute and United Nations Messenger of Peace. She will be on Zoom. And we have Sir Brian May. CB, the musician, singer, songwriter, and doctor in astrophysics, founder of Save Me Animal Welfare Organization. And we pulled this festival with Brian so many years ago. We did a lot of brainstorming that we have to design something to bring arts and science together. It was a long journey, very long journey, but at the end, we are here 20 years after. <laughs> so I'm happy that Brian is here with us. And um, we have uh, Tony Fadel, is an iPod inventor, iPhone co-inventor, Nest founder, and Build Collective Principal, a member of Starmus Advisory Board. We also have uh, Richard Marco, a cybersecurity expert and the CEO of Asset, a cybersecurity company, who is our main partner at this festival based in Slovakia and who will join forces with Starmus to pull this festival and make the best festival ever on this planet. So uh, uh, Richard is here with us. 
And we have Mary Calder, sociologist, a professor of global governance at the London School of Economics. She's also a director of the Civil Society and Human Security Research Unit. And we have Sir Martin Rees, cosmologist and astrophysicist, a legendary scientist. I was a kid when I was reading books of Sir Martin. <laughs> and he's a 15th Astronomer Royal appointed in 1995. And we have finally Emmanuel Charpentier, a member of Starmus Advisory Board. He's a professor and researcher of microbiology, genetics, and biochemistry. From 2015, she's been the director of Max Planck Institute of Infection Biology in Berlin. And in 2018, she founded Independent Research Institute at Max Planck Unit. In 2020, uh, Charpentier and uh, Jennifer Doudna were awarded Nobel Prize in Chemistry for development of the method of genome editing through CRISPR uh, technique. And this was the first science Nobel Prize ever won by two women. And uh, I would like to invite our guests to, to sit here. So please. Uh, I'll stay up here until I'll, I'll come in a little minute. <laughs> Okay. So first, uh, I would like to ask Brian his view on what's going on. Why are we here? What is happening today with Starmus? Where are we heading to? Okay. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'll show you my pretty picture first, <laughs> <laughs> which is the lenticular version of our logo, which is still under development, and we're designing various musical things to happen with it as well, which is a lot of fun. Of course, Starmus is, has always been about science and music and the arts. And we are here, as Garrick has said, to announce the seventh Starmus Festival, which will take place from the 12th to the 17th of May, 2024, in Bratislava, Slovakia. Maybe I can just remind you that the reason for the existence of Starmus is its core belief that the boundary between artistic thinking and scientific thinking is false. We believe that art and science are a continuum and the thought process, processes of each, when combined with an open mind, can provide the most powerful insights into questions that resist solutions. It was actually about 15 years ago that um, Garrick and I sat down with this crazy idea that we could actually bring art and science together in an environment where ideas could develop uh, in, a, in a different way from the normal way. And um, since that time, uh, Starmus has blossomed. We are now at number seven. Previous Starmus have always concentrated on looking out into the cosmos for the joy of it, really, and also for the edification of everybody there. Um, this particular Starmus, Starmus 7, we've called Starmus Earth because we were very conscious that um, everyone is more aware that the biosphere of planet Earth is under threat. So now, instead of looking outwards into the cosmos, Starmus 7 looks back into Earth. It focuses on the problems which Earth faces. Um, we've seen conferences between political representatives of countries looking for solutions, but of course, inevitably, whether they come up with strategies or not, they're influenced by political motives and the selfish interests of the countries they represent. There's also an issue with following through. Starmus, this Starmus, will be, to our knowledge, the very first attempt to bring together scientists and artists of all countries to try to find answers in a completely unbiased way. Answers to the questions about the planet's future that we know we now need to ask. We're hoping that by inviting some of the world's most free-thinking and brilliant brains to offer their individual thoughts, we will have a good chance of coming up by the end of the conference with a set of strategies which could save all the creatures which inhabit Earth. 
all the lecturers will be invited to speak on topics which relate to questions such as are the current gloomy predictions for the results of our present behaviour true or not? And is the cosmic clock running into the last seconds of the existence of life on Earth? And if so, is it already too late to make the necessary changes in our behaviours? Or are there effective strategies which can be implemented to reverse the trend? What are the attributes of life on Earth that are most worthy of saving? Should we be fighting the trends or accepting that we are in the middle of an in inevitable evolutionary stage in the life of any planet? These are all questions to ask. We hope to clearly identify the greatest threats to life on Earth. There is now at last a growing awareness that global warming is a present danger. But in reality, we see this as only the tip of the iceberg. We face so many potential threats, mostly man-made. Perhaps the end of our civilization will be brought about by a nuclear bomb, or by hunger, or by pollution, by loss of habitat, by artificial intelligence, or pandemic, or simply human overpopulation, or perhaps an asteroid strike or a catas cataclysmic eruption of the Earth's magma. Maybe dangers which we don't yet perceive. So by identifying the most destructive scenarios, perhaps we will conclude that we need to reorganize our priorities for mounting defenses against them. Perhaps, for instance, a non-political consortium, such as we are putting together, could find ways to make policies on a global basis rather than addressing the needs of individual countries. I should probably mention no politicians are at present invited to speak at Starmus Earth. As well as disaster proofing, in Bratislava we can look at in a positive way at how we can best enable life on Earth to flourish and prove that as a species, perhaps we are worthy to embark on the colonization of the neighborhood in space. That's really it. We hope that this will be something very special and we hope that out of it will come a new and clearer view of what we're facing and if planet Earth indeed does have a future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. Yes, indeed, the world today is very different from the world only two years ago. So in two years, we've seen pandemic, this war in Ukraine, exponential rise of AI, and much tighter limits on climate change and environment. So when we talk about changing world, it's really happening. And we see this only in two years. So my next question will be for Richard Marco, the cybersecurity specialist and the CEO of ESSET, related to his field of research and his activities. So Richard, we often see that cyber attacks create havoc in companies and governments and hear that possible they could trigger a new war. Today some scientists warn that AI threats are potentially more dangerous. What's your opinion as a cyber security expert? Could AI control and provide computer security? And could I ask my future chat GPT 10 or 15 to take care of the security of my computer, my credit cards, my personal data? Perhaps I may not even need an antivirus software as AI will choose one for me. And AI will have some internal routines and algorithms which will learn from minutes of hacker attacks history. And I will simply say to my AI software, hey, protect me. And it will be done. Do you think that's possible? This is the future. Right. I, I think this is a brilliant question because it actually touches different fields. And to give a proper answer, we would probably need to take into account expertise from different technology fields. And for that, I believe Starmus Festival is a perfect place. 
a place where uh, brightest minds come together, have time to talk to each other and ask these kind of questions. Uh, we at ESET, uh, we believe in science, we believe in research, in technology, that it can really help to move the society, the, the hum humanity forward. And so we are so happy to be a main partner of this festival. Now, the field of cybersecurity is a very dynamic field. It's probably one of the most interesting fields in IT overall, together probably with uh, artificial intelligence, and that makes the question even more relevant. Uh, for sure, the techniques, uh, uh, the artificial intelligence was important tool in cybersecurity for that maybe even two decades, because this field was always about dealing with big data, um, finding some irregularities in, in the data and behavior. And so uh, it, it, this is very important. Now, is the AI can, of course, be used uh, on the other side as well uh, to cre create more advanced attacks. But we need to realize that in cybersecurity, we are not fighting some natural disasters. We are fighting malicious activity of human beings. So there is a human intelligence there already present. And uh, the artificial intelligence can bring uh, bigger speed, uh, some or more variations into that. Maybe what we consider the biggest threats right now, so-called um, advanced persistent threats, which are crafted for individual companies or, or even individuals, these kind of attacks are now targeted against uh, really important people, important companies. But with, with the help of AI, this, this might become a norm, and this kind of targeted attacks might be just happen happening to anyone. Uh, and from this perspective, this, this is a new challenge. And I think uh, only research and really dedication to the, to the best, to the best development, to the best techniques uh, will be the answer to keep the things in balance. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you. We can ask you questions afterwards once we finish the panel. So my next question is for Emmanuel Charpentier. And um, uh, I don't want to ask questions about ethical aspects of genetic engineering, because I think that so many discussions about this. But my question will be, uh, Emmanuel, in your opinion, which problem is the most important and urgent that genetic engineering will try to solve in the near future? It can be one or even two. <laughs> what do you think is going to be sought by genetic engineering? The most urgent. <laughs> the most urgent, uh, the most urgent uh, actually, it's really to treat uh, human diseases. Uh, at least this is my opinion, and this was the first application that I had in mind. It was to use the technology to, to treat certain uh, genetic disorders. And actually, remarkably, after 10 years, uh, you know, we could uh, decipher a mechanism existing in bacteria that uh, has been harnessed into this very powerful genetic engineering te technology. So even eight years after, we could already see the technology being used to treat patients with uh, blood disorders such as uh, sickle cell anemia and beta thalassemia by combining the gene editing technology with cell therapy. So patients are now cured with this technology. And there will be soon, hopefully, an FDA uh, approval for a cure on the market and to be able to treat more patients with uh, those diseases. Uh, we have also um, uh, very great uh, examples of uh, proof of principles of using the technology uh, to cure patients with uh, certain types of leukemia, uh, with uh, using the, the gene editing technology in the context of cancer immunotherapy. So you have also patients being treated. And uh, so you have great developments to be foreseen <laughs> in, the, in the future. 
and more diseases to be to be cured. So this is really happening, and this is really exciting, and uh, and this is what uh, you know patients would like, I guess, to to see being developed further. And you have a second application that is important. My opinion is really using the technology to produce plant crops that can be, uh, you know, used to, in a way, uh, resist uh, the future uh, changes of, of climate. Uh, we will be facing uh, a lot of uh, changes in the climate, specifically in countries like Africa, and there is really a need to develop plant crops that can cope with all the challenges of of the changes of the climate and, and the technology is really being used as well for genetic engineering and, and the, for the production of very safe, uh, safe plant crops. So it's really safe genetic engineering, clean, uh, clean technologies. Very promising, very interesting. And we will have more discussions on this topic at Starmus, certainly led by Emmanuel Charpentier. So now I would like to ask uh, Martin Rees uh, for your opinion about the future of our planet as a cosmologist and as a futurist as, uh, as, uh, as Martin Rees. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you very much, Gareth, for inviting me. And I hugely look forward to Starburst 7 next year. Um, let me give a cosmic perspective because astronomers tend to think on these big scales. Um, our Earth has been around for 45 million centuries. But this present century is special. It's the first in all those 45 million when one species, namely the human species, has the future of the planet in its hands. And as we've heard already from Brian, we are facing huge dangers of how we could uh, destroy our planet or set back human life. And also we have to worry about uh, not just human life, but the marvellous biosphere of which we're a part and keeping that alive and preserving it. And I'd like to quote the great ecologist E.O. Wilson who says, if our actions lead to mass extinction, it's the sin that future generations will least forgive us for. It could be an irreversible loss. So we have huge responsibilities. And the other thing that one knows as an astronomer is that um, the future is probably longer than the past. The Earth's been around for this huge span of time, but the sun won't die for another six billion years, 60 million centuries. And that, therefore, means that we should not think of ourselves as being the culmination of evolution, and maybe not even a halfway stage. And therefore, if we snuff things out now, we destroy not just what's on the planet at the moment, but we may foreclose huge potentialities on Earth and far beyond. Well, what might those be? We think about whether uh, humans are going to move out into space. Certainly, with the advent of AI, uh, we are going to be able to send uh, um, sophisticated probes to study all the bodies in our solar system. We're going to be able to assemble in space uh, large solar energy collectors and other bodies of that kind. Um, Will humans follow? Well, I'm ambivalent about this because um, although humans in space are a great adventure, robots can now much more cheaply and reliably do all the things that humans can do, assembling structures in space, exploring the surface of Mars, etc. So I think if humans are to go into space, they will go as privately funded adventurers accepting high-risk trips in the manner of earlier generation explorers. We've met at earlier Starmer's meetings, uh, the uh, Apollo astronauts who took very high risks, but subsequently NASA has become very risk-averse in 
launching group into space. The uh, shuttle failed twice in 135 launches, less than 2% failure rate, but even that was regarded as rather high by American taxpayers. So my view is that for humans to be sent into space by a body like NASA or ESA would be hugely expensive, and so it should be left to the billionaires who can launch the kind of people happy to accept high risks. But what about the far future? Um, of course, um, uh, humans are not the culmination of evolution, and the key question is the extent to which um, uh, flesh and blood entities will become post-humans, or whether the post-human era will be dominated by AI. And uh, uh, again, this is a fascinating topic, which I guess will be discussed. It affects the future of the, um, uh, of the life on Earth. Um, but uh, uh, what we don't know is whether at some stage the um, uh, flesh and blood intelligences like ours will be surpassed by something electronic. I think that what may happen is that uh, humans will survive on this planet for quite a long time because we're well adapted. Whereas if we attempt to send communities to other worlds, like trying to live on Mars or further away, then they'll be very ill-adapted and they will have to adapt seriously and become a post-human species. And at that stage, they may prefer to be electronic. And if they're electronic, then they may not want to be on a planet at all. Uh, they uh, may prefer zero G and they may be near immortal. So post-humans may make interstellar voyages, not humans. And of course, my final point, which is a scientific question that I hope will be answered this century, is, is the galaxy awaiting our post-human progeny or is there lots of life out there already? Uh, this is the question which, as an astronomer, I'm most often asked, and it is indeed one of the most fascinating questions, and uh, uh, a new perspective on this issue has arisen in the last uh, two or three decades in two ways. First, um, we have understood a bit more about the origin of life. We still don't know how life began. We don't know the transition between complex chemistry and the first metabolizing, reproducing entities we call alive. We understand Darwinian evolution after that, but we don't know whether it was a rare fluke or whether it would have happened in other places. And what we've learned in the last decade or two is that um, many other stars are surrounded by retinues of planets, just as the sun is surrounded by the Earth and the other familiar planets. And there are probably, in our Milky Way galaxy, many millions, maybe even billions, of planets like the young Earth, about the size of the Earth and orbiting a stable star, so there's a temperature where water can exist. And, of course, the key question is, will some of them have evolved life, even intelligent life? And uh, there are serious efforts to try and address those questions using big telescopes of various kinds. And uh, I, in fact, chair the committee funded by Yuri Milner in California to look for evidence for intelligent life in space and a lot of other projects looking for any kind of vegetation on any of these planets. So this is a kind of exciting development. And that will tell us um, whether a disaster to the human race is a terrestrial disaster or natural cosmic disaster, which will foreclose the option of the uh, entire universe being greened by human descendants. Thank you very much, Martin. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Can I ask you one question? Do you think that AI can replace humans in interpreting in an interpretation of data? So um, we are yeah. doing astronomical observations. Yes. Maybe AI can give better explanation of what we are observing than us. Yes. Well, already we depend on it because, for instance, the European Space Agency telescope, uh, Gaia, provided data on two billion stars. 
their colors and their motions, etc. That has only been analyzed because of the possibility of AI to look for uh, correlations between the speeds and, the, and that. Um, so s certainly uh, that's true. And of course, we depend on uh, um, our computers to do um, simulations because we can't um, do experiments in space. We can't uh, crash stars together in, uh, or crash galaxies together. But in the virtual world of our computer, we can do this sort of thing making different assumptions. And the reason we have learned a great deal about how stars evolve and how galaxies evolve and how our cosmos has emerged from its hot, dense beginnings is because we can do simulations with enough power to get results that we can take seriously. So I, I think that, um, it's crucially important that we have um, AI. And of course, there may be some concept which is just too hard for the human brain to understand, uh, you may have heard about string theory, which is uh, uh, the most popular idea to unify gravity and the force of the micro world. Um, and uh, uh, we need a theory of this kind to understand the very, very beginning of our universe. And this involves um, uh, geometry in 10 dimensions. It involves the idea that empty space, which you think of as three dimensional, if you magnify a point in our empty space, then it's actually a tightly wound origami in five extra dimensions. Very, very complicated geometry. And it could be this geometry is too hard for any human being to work through his lifetime and check whether the theory is right. And so I think we may, um, by analogy with um, um, uh, the deep mind computers playing, playing Go and doing protein folding, we may have to um, find a computer and feed in the properties of some geometry and let it crunch away, and it will then be able to um, uh, perhaps um, uh, see if it can uh, predict from this theory uh, what the um, mass of the electron or the strength of gravity would be. And if it predicts the right answer, then we know there's something in that theory. But of course, the frustration is we'll never get the sort of aha insight, which you get if you... Uh, uh, if you've got a theory and it seems almost obvious in retrospect. We never have that view, but we would know that the uh, uh, version of string theory that we were using uh, would have um, uh, uh, w w has predicted some things correctly, and therefore we can perhaps trust whether it predicts something about the Big Bang. And in particular, one of my interests is whether it predicts that there was not just one Big Bang, but many, <laughs> whether we were in a multiverse, not just the universe. Uh, so that's an exciting scientific topic. Mm. Yeah. Well. Thank you very much, Mark. Very interesting. Uh, we hope to, to hear from Jane Goodell. Can we check if uh, Jane is... Oh. I hear you. Hello? I hear you. Hello? <laughs> yes. Well, welcome to Starmus. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, Jane, we are extremely, extremely honored and happy that you join our advisory board. And you are here today with us uh, to announce Starmus 7 Festival about Earth, about environment, about the future of our planet. So uh, why it is important to protect wi wildlife in a world dominated by humans. We dominate the world. Well, I think what's really important, are you hear me? Yes. Okay. I think it's really important for us to understand that we are part of the natural world. And it's very tragic that humans are becoming increasingly divorced from nature. We know now that being in nature is good for our psychological and physical well-being. And when I say we're part of the natural world, we also depend on it. We depend on it for food, for water, for air, for everything. But what we depend on is healthy ecosystems. And an ecosystem is made up of a complex mix of plant and animal species, each one with a role to play, no matter how small. And I see it as like a beautiful living tapestry. And every time 
a species disappears from that particular ecosystem, it's like pulling a thread from the tapestry. And if we pull enough threads from the tapestry, then it will hang in tatters and the ecosystem will collapse. And the tragedy is that all around the world, ecosystems are collapsing, those very ecosystems on which we depend. You know, I spent years out in the rainforest studying chimpanzees, uh, our closest living relatives. And the main thing that makes us different from chimps and other animals is the explosive development of our intellect. But unfortunately, while we can uh, move into these scientific technological spheres of AI and space exploration and so on, we have lost wisdom for the here and now, the wisdom that makes decisions thinking about future generations, our children and their children. And this to me is a great tragedy because I believe that to attain our true human potential, head and heart must work together. I see our human race right now, and this is a poetical fancy, but I see us as at the mouth of a very long and very dark tunnel. And right at the end of that tunnel is a little star shining. And that star is hope. But it's no good sitting at the mouth of the tunnel and hoping the star will soon shine on us. No, we have to roll up our sleeves. We have to climb over, crawl under, work our way around all the obstacles that lie between us and the star. And those obstacles largely are interrelated. Climate change, loss of biodiversity, uh, pollution, poverty, because people in poverty will destroy the environment in order to survive, unsustainable lifestyles, uh, the use of chemicals and pesticides in agriculture that is not only devastating for biodiversity, but also killing the very soil on which we depend. And it's harming our own health. Obviously, if you spray poison on your food, it's bound to lead to some of the many, many diseases that are increasing in frequency. And many people believe are due to all these chemicals used in industrial agriculture. And another thing the chimpanzees taught me is that we humans are not, as I was told in Cambridge in 1962, I was told that the difference between humans and animals was an unbridgeable chasm, that only personality, mind and emotion existed in us. They were unique to us. And I shouldn't have attributed these characteristics to chimpanzees. But gradually, as more and more was known about the biological similarities, the, um, particularly the DNA of chimps and humans differs in structure by only just over 1%. And then all the other similarities, kissing, embracing, holding hands, um, even sadly, violence and a kind of primitive warfare and killing each other. But <clears throat> the main difference uh, between them and all the other animals that we now know are way, way more intelligent than we used to think, is this explosive development of the in intellect. And so how strange that the most intellectual being that's ever walked the planet, presumably, uh, is destroying its only home. And I, I believe there's a window of time and I believe that one of the most important things right now is to give people hope. Because if we lose hope, we fall into apathy and do nothing. And then we definitely are doomed. And in particular, our young people. That's why I work uh, 300 days a year going around the world, and particularly raising awareness in everybody, but our groups of young people, we call them roots and shoots, in 68 countries from kindergarten through university, they all have as their main um, saying, every single one of us matters, every single one of us has a role to play, every single one of us makes some impact every single day, and we can choose what sort of impact we make. And because I learned in the rainforest how everything is interconnected, each group 
choose those projects, one to help people, one to help animals, one to help the environment. And something that's very important that comes out of this, and I say it's important, there's already been mention of the war in Ukraine and the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians, Indians and Pakistanis, the conflicts in Sudan, which have broken out again in Mali and other places too, and the social unrest. Very often, it's due to the fact that we tend to um, separate the different aspects of humanity. And the young people in our Roots and Shoots program, we try to bring them together, usually virtually, and they come to understand that much more important than the color of our skin, our language, our, our socioeconomic position, uh, even our religion and our culture is the fact we're all humans. We all share the same blood. We all laugh. We all cry. We are a family. Yes, there's fighting, even in families, uh, human families, there are many, many squabbles, but at least we are one family. So I am concerned about my grandchildren and their children and their children. I'm concerned about the present. I'm concerned about saving the planet now before it's too late. And so at the end of all our Roots and Shoots gatherings, I was finding that the children were standing together from different places and saying, together we can. And I said, yes, we can, we have the tools, we know what to do, but do we have the will to do it? Politicians and businesses, do they have the will? So now the young people stand up, together we can, together we will, and I add, and together we must. And I've even had big groups of businessmen and politicians joining in that. Because one thing the children do, they can influence their parents and their grandparents. And I'll end with one last example. A CEO of a big international company told me that for 10 years, he's been really working to make all his um, officers around the world, all his um, projects to be ethical for the environment, for the people, fair wages, helping the communities in his offices around the world and in the way he treats his customers. He said, for three reasons, I've seen the writing on the wall we're using up natural resources in many places too fast for nature to replenish them. Secondly, consumer pressure. People are beginning to ask questions about where did this come from? Could I have bought it locally? Did it harm the environment? Was it cruel to animals? Is it cheap because of unfair wages? And if so, they're demanding different kinds of products. But he said, what tipped the balance was my little girl of eight she came home from school one day and she said, Daddy, they're telling me that what you're doing is hurting the planet. That's not true, is it, Daddy? Because it's my planet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jane. We are very much looking forward to see you at Starmus in Slovakia. Thank you. Okay, so my next question will go for uh, Tony Fadel about artificial intelligence. Uh, can we see Tony? Uh, Screen. Hey, Gary, yeah. can you hear me? Oh, yes, I can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> so, Tony, uh, about AI. Everyone is talking about AI taking over the world. People in media talk about unemployment rates and that our lives will be controlled by AI. And what about the banking and financial system? So why should I trust any products from my bank if ChatGPT 6 or 7 would tell me, would advise me, forget this bank or transfer your money to another bank within five minutes because your bank will collapse in, 
in two hours, there is 98% probability that this is going to happen. If you don't do it now, you will lose all your savings, etc. So this may happen. This may happen because they will become our main advisors. AI is becoming our advisor. So they will be analyzing all data from all uh, everywhere in the world and they will be advising me what to do with my bank within the next 24 hours, right, with my savings. And even worse, what's going to happen with the stock market? Because if AI comes there, they're going to advise buy or sell. So basically all the risks will be taken by AI. So, and if there is no risk, there is no market economy. So who is going to take those risks in market economy? We or AI? All right, Garrick. That's the question uh, <laughs> that I will ch I'm not going to completely answer. But first, I want to thank everyone for coming here today and listening to about the announcement of Starma 7. It's really wonderful to be up here on stage here in Bratislava as well as with uh, our esteemed uh, other panelists uh, in London. Um, it's a unique festival, and I'm honored to be a part of it um, because the 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 cities that actually host Starmus, it's Starmus is such a special festival of a coming together of incredible minds that it takes incredible and so unique that it takes incredible minds, incredible people to want to have Starmus in their town. So to be here in Bratislava is really great. Now to get back to your question, uh, Garrick, the first thing we can say is we just saw a meltdown of the financial markets just weeks ago with Silicon Valley Bank, with First Republic, with Credit Suisse. Those were driven by humans literally on social networks. There were a run on the banks and there was no AI involved. So this, today we can already still take down financial systems with the tools that we have and no AI is required. So it's humans, not necessary computers or the technology that we have, that actually create a lot of these situations. So let me back up. Let's talk about AI. The first thing is let's talk about technology. What I've always witnessed is that whenever humans create a new technology, we co-evolve with those technologies. Whether it was the fire, the wheel, whether it was penicillin, all of these different technologies that we create we can choose to co-evolve with peacefully or not peacefully. Technology is neutral. So we have seen this time and again where we've, we've created destructive technologies. Unfortunately, in the US, there's way too many guns. That's a technology as well. We can let it go out of control or we can choose to control it properly. So AI is another technology. Now, given that, we're all hearing about AI. We're hearing about AI incredibly, in every, almost everyone's talking about it. It's around the world. Well, guess what? AI has been coming for a long time and it has been here for almost a decade in practical uses. You may not have seen it, you may have not felt it, but AI has been below the surface, working on things, improving things, and has been, has been helping. In fact, my company, Nest, that I created, you know, oh, well, I don't know, 12 years ago, we had AI inside of it. We just didn't call it artificial intelligence. We call we called it something else because people were going, we worried that people were going to get worried about it. There has been AI helping out behind the scenes when you do a Google search for years. There's been AI inside of Photoshop and Adobe tools. These things have been all behind the scenes already working on, I, I know multiple companies that I've invested in. AI has been around for years, okay? What we've seen different in the last five months is that a personality has been put on it, a way to talk to it, okay? Now we can say, hey, what about this? And it comes back with personality, like it'll tell you, it'll give you a, a, a answer to a question in Shakespearean prose. We also talk about AI taking over the world in terms of it being one thing, like one AI takes over. There are so many different AIs already out there in all kinds of different forms, all kinds of different 
uh, large language models, as you'll hear, LLMs, and in all kinds of other forms. They're already out there. They already have personalities. There's already different religious chatbots that you can talk to for different religions, and they can espouse as being a prophet uh, to you about that religion. You can do the same thing in finance today. You can also do it for virtual mates, girlfriends, boyfriends, what have you. Those are already existing. We are not going to have one AI that takes over. There's going to be AIs simply that reflect us. You can make an AI of yourself. There are people making AIs of yourself, and I've even considered making an AI of myself, given all of my podcasts, all of the interviews, all of my texts, all the things that are in. You can make an AI of yourself. You can make a, not a digital, yeah, a digital twin, maybe not a complete digital twin. So we're not going to have just one AI. AI is a technology we can choose to co-evolve with. People have chosen before there were computers and before in companies as well, uh, and governments, we can choose to co-evolve with those. We see companies who didn't evolve, uh, you know, take up digital technology. They are laggards. The ones that embrace those things are now leaders. It's the same thing going to happen with AI. That said, there are incredible things that can be done with AI, I have seen done, that are positive for our species, positive for humans on Earth, and we can use these tools for good. The downside of these tools are not for me, is not that AI is going to take over. It's humans using these tools against humans. That's the issue. We're not going to see these ultra intelligent beings if we allow them to go away from us and allow them to get a th through from us. Maybe that's in the future. But right now, we don't need to worry about AIs taking over being fully autonomous from humans. What we have to worry about is humans using AIs to create things to program humans in a new way to do their bidding, okay? The worst into artificial intelligence I find in the world is when people are reprogrammed. Reprogrammed, we saw it in social networks with elections. We see it all the time with different genocides using social networks. We just saw it with the financial system. When we use these tools against humans, humans using these tools against humans, that's where the, the issue is. Yes, we have to worry about the threat of AIs and multiple AIs even going to war. And humans aren't even involved. AIs can actually war with each other if, they ch if we choose to set it up that way. What we need to do right now is we need to worry about regulation. We need to worry about the data sets. Let's talk about the data sets of AI. So today in large language models, what they are, let me give you an analogy. An analogy specifically is, we all, most of us, yeah, who has kids in here? How many people have kids in here? Okay. What do you do? The kid is born, there's, you make sure you understand what education they get, what books they read, they get older, and then, you know, you can't control everything. But you try to give them a base set of fundamental values, morals, ethics, these types of things. And then over time, they use those as base to then learn and, and, and grow and adapt in society. With these models that we're seeing that we have human kind of interfaces with, what we do is we give them the entirety of the internet. A lot of these data sources they have are have bad things in them. We would never go and give the entirety of information to our kids and just say, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. That's exactly how these AIs work today. We give them an entirety of all this information and then we tell them what not to do. Please don't do that. And we think we know all of the things that things are going to happen. There are so many things that we can't imagine and we're trying to subtractively take out of these models. We need to look at better data sets, more robust data sets. We need to have firewalls around things to really understand what we're training these, 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 these AI agents with and then ultimately who's using them and how they're being used. And we need to have regulations and things around that. So again, we can co-evolve with the technologies. AI has been here for some time. It has been beneficial. AI is being used by humans against humans. That's what we have to be worried about. That's what we need to work on now. And we need to make sure that these models are trained on data sets that we understand. And understand, just like, as I said, there's different personalities. We know who we trust. 
in the in the in in, in our world who we can talk to and we believe in a trusted person that we we get feedback from. We're going to have trusted and untrusted AIs as well because it's going to be built on those data sets or what they're trained on and the value systems that are built into them. So. Garrick, that was a long way of answering your question. There is a lot of promise. There is a lot of peril with AI, but we can't stick our heads in the ground and just believe AI is going to take over. It's for us to control and us to co-evolve with. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tony. Uh, so finally, I want to ask uh, Mary Calder, who is a sociologist, and um, what do you think about the future? What's the future of this society? A society which is constantly on the threats of well, war and everything. <coughs> well, I suppose my main concern, uh, which is interlinked with all the other issues that we've heard, is that we face a world of continuing violence, or we may even face the threat of extinction through violence. And I think um, it's important to notice that military technology has evolved to such a point that it's actually impossible for anyone to gain a decisive military advantage. So it's really impossible to win nowadays. You can use a cheap drone um, with mobile phone technology or an improvised explosive device using fertilizers or detergents and destroy the most advanced weapon systems. <laughs> and although there's an in always an endless offensive defensive competition in cybersecurity to try to anticipate, it's almost impossible. So that's the lesson, actually, we should have learned at the end of the Second World War. We should have learned it from Korea. We should have learned it from Vietnam. We should have learned it from Iraq. We should have learned it from Afghanistan. And now we're learning it from Ukraine. And the risk is either that such wars escalate, to, and we face a very real risk, in my view, of the use of nuclear weapons, and that leads to human extinction, or they <coughs> disintegrate into a kind of long-term chaos. And that's what we're seeing for in increasingly large parts of the world. We see it in the Congo. Uh, we see it in Syria. Um, we see it in Yemen. We see it in Afghanistan. Uh, and now it's just beginning in Sudan, or actually it had already begun, but it's really alarming. And what happens in these situations is these various armed groups are not trying to win. In fact, battles are rather rare. They're using violence for other purposes. They're using violence for economic purposes, for smuggling, for setting up checkpoints, for looting, for kidnapping. And they're using it to generate the kind of we, them ideologies that Jane Goodall was talking about that keeps the violence going. And I think if we think about Ukraine, in a way, I think that's exactly what Putin wants. It's his way of destroying democracy. And my fear is that as a consequence of Ukraine, we'll see this kind of violence in Ukraine and in Russia. And... At that point, is it really, you know, what you end up with is a situation where a few rich warlords provide their protected enclaves and are quite happy to live in a context of chaos. But in that situation, we can't do any of the things we need to do to deal with climate change, to protect our species. It's like, you know, strands of Jane Goodall's tapestry being pulled out all the time. So that is my big concern, which I bring to the table of all the other concerns. And the question is, is there any way out of that? You know, war is prohibited under the UN Charter, um, except if it's approved by the Security Council, which is now dominated by Russia, China, or in self-defense. Um, 
And I think we just have to take the UN Charter seriously. We have to reform the UN Security Council, but we also have to, we really need an effective system of global governance that finally goes beyond war and takes human beings more seriously. I think Brian's suggestion of a non-political consortium, world consortium, is a really important suggestion. What we find uh, in all our, I, I work on these wars, in all of these cases, that you find amazing human beings who are helping their neighbors, who provide emergency responses in situations, who try to mediate, who try to keep schools and hospitals going, and they get very little support. I feel they're the opportunity for making peace, and if we could build a non-political consortium that involves all these kinds of people in very difficult places, maybe we could do something to help. A lot of people are now talking about how we need to think about human security rather than military security, and human security is about all of these existential threats, uh, and that's the direction we need to go in. Well, thank you very much, Mary, and uh, I think... Uh, uh, we will finish, well, before finishing, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Garak Israelian. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the director of the festival. <laughs> so if something doesn't work, you will blame me on this. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm not sure, Brian, you showed the poster or... Yes. <laughs> so Brian designed the poster of Starmus 7. He actually designed many things for Starmus, including Stephen Hawking, Mayor for Science Communication, and our logo. So we feel like a very important part of the festival when we start with the design of things, which gives Thanks, things. Mm -hmm. If I can just <laughs> jump in for a second. I'm, I'm fascinated by what happened today because we've had wonderful speeches from people who have insights which are stimulating to us. And this is just the beginning. We're, we're seeing all sorts of questions being raised which we can't answer yet. And some of them may get answered in Starmus Earth. We certainly hope so. And I find it incredibly stimulating. I mean, I suppose especially the AI door opening. And I'm wondering if there's a link, if there's some link between a consortium which would try to bring peace to the Earth. Maybe I, AI could be brought to drive that, maybe AI, maybe there is a giant, I'm probably being very naive here, excuse me, but maybe there's some way to bring AI, a giant AI, um, to bear on that situation to try to bring about world peace. Maybe, maybe the AI can find some sort of insight uh, that we've been unable to find. <laughs> I'm listening to Martin Rees talking about string theory, I'm hoping that you know, if, if AI is the only thing that can understand String theory. I hope it will explain it to me someday. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a superhuman brain. <laughs> I, don't, I don't get it yet. <laughs> I'm not sure I even get AI. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, today we announced 40 speakers, confirmed speakers for Starmus uh, 7. And we'll be... Yes, we... Maybe we, we should... Um... Yeah, it's in our website already, in Starmus mm -hmm. website. Mm -hmm. And we'll be working with Brian, especially Brian, to make sure that we also have top artists and music part of Starmus because it's science and arts festival. Mm -hmm. So after this phase, the, the next one will be announcing all artists, also for film industry and musicians that will join Starmus sometime in October, November, that we will make this announcement. And uh, so that's it. And thank you very much, and we hope to see you in Slovakia next year, May 12, 17. Yeah. <laughs> yes, now questions, if you have questions from... I'm so embarrassed about my daughters. ...for our speakers. This is life, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. 
Uh, hello, I'm Catherine Fiddler from Metro Newspaper. Uh, thank you for a really fascinating talk from everyone. Very much appreciated. A very quick question for Sir Martin Rees. If quantum computing reaches the heights that we hope it will, uh, do you think that will surpass AI in its potentials for exploring the universe and potentially finding somebody out there? Yes. Um, uh, well, of course, as you know, uh, Quantum computing can get round the, sim the uh, limitations of uh, the sort of binary nature of ordinary computing. Um, uh, there are huge technical problems of making quantum computers, um, but I think they will, in some contexts, surpass um, the uh, uh, achievements of present computers. Um, if, if I can um, uh, make a response to, uh, to Mary, um, uh, I worry about leaving too many decisions to AI, because um, if there are some hidden bugs in the system, then is anyone going to be clever enough to find them? Um, you know, and if there are breakdowns, uh, then I think this is a worry. It's already a worry, I think, in the way AI is used for um, um, selecting job applicants, deciding whether you need surgery and things of that kind. Um, but uh, if we depend globally on some AI, um, then even if on the whole it looks reliable. I really worry that if it's got some flaws, they may be so deeply hidden that it would never be possible to uh, save them. Mm. I didn't say anything about it. Mm. Were you reacting to somebody else? Sorry? <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, no, no, sorry if it's wrong. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. yeah, yeah, yes, yes. About the, about the mega machine taking over. Yeah. 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 I, I don't know if anyone's asked this question, but are we looking at another kind of Copenhagen? Is it a question of who gets the ultimate power through AI and, and quantum uh, computing? Uh, is it the good guys or the bad guys? Are we looking at that kind of situation ever? Are, are you hiding this from us? <laughs> <laughs> That's what Tony. Yeah, well, Tony? yeah. Well, when it comes to AI, um, actually, very interestingly, um, there has been a. Uh, you know, we see that the large language models and the large companies with hundreds of millions of dollars being able to create these these AIs. But at the same time, we've already seen open source versions of these LLMs in just literally three to four months be able to near the same kind of uh, results that you're seeing from the largest companies. So you can actually see where, um, you know, uh, groups of humans can work together to create an AI that is open for lots of people to use. The issue is, is when do these, could nefarious actors use them against us? So it's not just large companies Groups of individuals without huge resources can actually create their own AIs and they can use them for good or bad, so, or, or governments for that matter. So we have, it's, this is an unleashed an incredible power and it can go all the way to single actors using, the, building and using this technology. But let's just flip it to the other side. Martin is right. It, if we choose to give up the capabilities over to AI, it can now start to really make decisions for us, almost a kind of eugenics um, for our population if we choose to move, to move to allowing AI to make decisions for us. But then, as another counterpoint to this, we have something called Wikipedia. Wikipedia isn't perfect, but it's managed by a whole team of people around the world, making sure the data sets of Wikipedia are more or less accurate. What happens if we were able to create data sets just like Wikipedia with teams of people around the world looking at these data sets and using them to train AIs on top of, and we know where they come from. So there's lots of different modalities, different ways of creating the AIs, you don't have to just be large actors with lots of money. 
and we can also use, we can band together as, as societies and create things. We already have examples, analogs of that. So I have no answers, but absolutely there are mul multiple ways that these things can be created and multiple ways they can be used. And we need to seriously look at all of those implications. And I hope at Starmus we're going to be talking about a lot of those. Yeah, maybe, maybe one thing... Uh, which, because this AI is obviously like the biggest topic right now, but maybe the thing to realize is that apart from Tony already said that there are many different AIs being used for a long time in different places, and now the chat GPT is just, is just coming with a form that is available to anybody basically to use, is that uh, some of these most famous forms of uh, AI are developed by, by really big tech companies uh, with a lot of resources. It's, it's not a typical ac academy world. It, the rules, the incentives are not exactly the same. So we need to take into account that, for example, chat GPT is not really open. Thing. We don't know exactly all the details, how it works, what was the data set that was used to train it. And it didn't go through all the scrutiny, so we, so we don't know whether it just looks great and beautiful uh, and it's over-promising or it's really something that is bringing the discussion or capabilities of artificial intelligence to the next level. This remains to be seen. Absolutely. And what I'd love to see is, you know, why don't we take all the data sets of the Starmus uh, presenters, uh, all of our advisors, all the previous Starmus presenters, and create an AI with all of their uh, <laughs> incredible, uh, incredible works, and then see what, ask those questions. I would love to see a, a digital representation of Martin and Brian together and ask them questions and see where that goes. Uh, you know, uh, but uh, seriously, we can actually think about data sets with the world's Nobel Prize winners and put that together and make an incredibly smart AI that we understand the data that goes into it as opposed to all the nefarious and ugly things from the internet that get programmed into a lot of the LLMs that are, are out there today because we just haven't done the we haven't done the data set modeling the proper way. So I think we can have incredible intelligence if we choose uh, the right people to hear from and put into these models to learn from. Because AI at the end of the day yeah. just <laughs> reflects us. It reflects our humanity, good and bad. So let's choose the good, let's choose the best, and use that to help us move forward. Not the, not the evil parts. Mm -hmm. Tony, I've got to ask the last question, if I may. Um, how long do we have the choice, though? Surely AI, an, AI, an AI machine can eventually get clever enough to choose its own data sets. It can circumvent what we give it. It, it has access to anything it wants because yes. it's cleverer than us, right? So, mm -hmm. so when do we lose the reins? When, when are we no longer holding those, those controls? Well, well, very well, interestingly very enough, so AI, right now, right now, what we have is ChatGPT3, ChatGPT3.5, ChatGPT4. Well, they froze the model at ChatGPT4. Chat when you do all your queries and everything, today it doesn't learn any more than it already has. When you add new information to it, then it can start to learn on new information. We need to have humans always in the loop for what data goes into these models. We can't have self-replicating AI agents who can go off and retrain themselves. Today as humans, what we have is we go out and learn. We go and learn something that day. That at night, we consolidate that in our brains and we come out the next day hopefully learned and we're going to do something different and hopefully a little better. Today, right now, that consolidation phase does not happen at OpenAI. It does not happen at Google. There is this kind of batch processing. First, you take all the data, train it, and then it stays static. 
If we close the loop and say it's fully dynamic like humans are, that's where we're going to, that's where it's going to get really weird very, very quickly because we're not going to know where those data sets came from and how it's learning each day. And to, to further some other points, we don't even understand how these LLMs work from an engineering or scientific perspective. We don't understand them yet. We need to understand not just the data sets, but how they work internally and how we see the hallucinations happening out in the real world. The, everyone is still challenged. Even yesterday, uh, OpenAI said that they're working on tools to, so they can figure out how the, the things that they're creating are actually working. And when a neuron is not working, uh, a digital neuron isn't working properly or when it is working and why it's working properly. We're all trying to learn about this right now. But what we can't let is it getting away where it's self-replicating and self-consolidating with new data all the time. Right now, we can have a static set and we can start to analyze and really understand and empirically test and figure out what's going on before we start any of these other things where it self-evolves. Yeah, maybe, maybe <laughs> one, <laughs> one, one point, uh, just to add it, because now we talk about AI, we talk about technologies, computers, and so on. The uh, uh, artificial neural networks are very different from, from biological neural networks. We, there is some inspiration, uh, there is some similarity, but the complexity of a single neuron, natural neuron, is, is probably several orders of magnitude different compared to, to the artificial one. Now, it, does this make a difference? We don't know. Maybe, maybe it's not necessary to have this complexity in a single neuron, but I, I think it's fair to say it might be the, the thing that makes a difference and that we will get to the limit of what the raw computational power is able to do with the current models and the current really way these uh, artificial networks are working. Mm. Okay. We Thank could you. have a conversation yeah. all day. Oh. <laughs> and more questions you have? No? Okay, then we will finish with this, maybe. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Bratislava.